Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name, as I just said, is Santiago, and in the following two hours, we will be discussing together uh, a little bit about uh, today's internet and how we can improve it, okay? Um, so, uh, first, uh, as some of you may not be of technical background, we will do a little review of today's uh, uh, internet architecture, that is TCP IP, and we will uh, try to understand together what problems it arises. And on the second half of this presentation, we will talk, we will introduce RENA, we will introduce RENA's fundamentals, we will understand how it works, what is its structure, and then uh, how by this structure we can enhance the internet, we can um, uh, all the, from all the pro solve all the problems that the current architecture presents. Okay, so uh, let's start with the very first block. So, what is the internet? Can someone can someone does someone know like what is the internet? What is the definition of the internet? What do they understand for internet? Sorry, loud. Right, it's a network of networks, so it's uh, uh, different internet service providers, different uh, organizations that have huge networks, they connect each other for mutual benefits. In that sense, it's a network of networks. But we will try to um, understand a little bit more what does it matter and try to think together if it's actually a network of networks or it's just like one huge network, okay? So, as a... The very first approach is thinking, okay, that uh, internet is a network of networks, uh, in this, a network would be uh, two or more computers uh, connected to each other uh, that its aim is to uh, share data, okay? Um, so, uh, but how like this all started? What's, uh, how, how can they actually communicate? How this works? Well, uh, the, it's very important to make a, a major focus on the initial approach of the internet. Because, uh, b because of this uh, initial focus, uh, we inherited all the problems that we have today. Uh, in the ends, ends of the 60s, uh, the ARPANET, uh, which is the uh, ancestor of the internet, was created and it gathered four machines. But uh, there is a problem with the ARPANET and that was inherited by the internet. It's that the aim of the ARPANET was not networking science itself. It was not study how networks function, how computer networks function, but uh, it was just seen as a tool for other uh, industries, namely uh, military industry and education. Uh, at the same time, this was this uh, ARPANET was this, uh, developed in the US. In France, there was CLADS, which was actually uh, a network made to research on networks. And some of the, um, some of the fundamentals of CLADS are taken now in order to create RENA. Okay, so this story, uh, there was a war in between uh, these, the computer companies and the telephony companies because they wanted to have the, um, the smart part of the industry, like the, the, um, the high value part, into their uh, knowledge bases. So this, this war was kind of won by the telephony companies and that's why we see telecommunications as a uh, as a value for tele telecom companies at the moment. Also, there was a war between Europe, USA, and Japan in order to lead this uh, revolution, okay? Uh, in the 1995, like the internet, how we know today, uh, was created, and there were like different service providers who connected to each other in order to create a large scale network uh, for people to communicate and to get service from, okay? So, when I'm saying client-server, does anyone know what it means? So, basically, the client and server, we can think, okay, it's two computers, okay, I am the client, I open my computer and I write youtube.com because I want to watch a video, okay? So, YouTube would be the server. The YouTube is giving me a service and I am the client. The server is just another computer. It's not nothing magical. It's another computer that holds a service, that provides a service to me that I'm the client. This is an important concept for, for networks, okay? But uh, another thing that I want to mention is, uh, okay, what is an architecture? Because we're talking, we're saying, okay, today's architecture is flawed, 
and there are other options for internet architecture, but what is an architecture? So in case of buildings here, we have three different buildings that are for different purposes. We have a bridge, we have a cathedral, we have a governmental house, and we can all see that it's they are uh, of Gothic architecture. Uh, can someone say why do you understand that it's a Gothic architecture? What do you see? When you see a building, you know it's Gothic or it's not Gothic. It's very obvious. But what, uh, what do you check? Pointy things. Yeah, the pointy things, right? What else? The windows, for example. So the illumination of the buildings, uh, how the interiors are made, right? Uh, the tall, long designs, those pointy things. So those are elements, right? So when an architect wants to create a, a Gothic building, they, talk, they take these elements and they create a building that is adapted to the requirements of this building. But the architecture creates different uh, buildings. So we can make an analogy here and think uh, that uh, with networks it's the same. So the architecture are the invariant uh, parts, the, the rules, okay, right? The patterns, the methodologies, and then we have networks that are different and they have uh, different objectives but they are still part of the same architecture. So because this is a very common mistake in certain stages. So for example, here you have four different um, networks, but they are all TCP, uh, TCP IP architecture. So see, if I'm saying like an average uh, cellular network, 4G, 5G, 3G, whatever G you want, it's still TCP IP. It's the same architecture. The same for a, a Wi-Fi wireless network. It's the same architecture, a data center network or an internet service provider right now. Uh, I don't want to say all because that's kind of tricky, but most networks are TCP IP uh, networks, okay? And uh, what is this TCP IP that I'm talking, okay? Uh, first of all, uh, today's network, uh, it's loosely, uh, loosely, uh, based on the OSI uh, model. This OSI model is a layer model that you have here, the layers. Uh, there are different versions, so the ones who have already course some networking, some topics of networking may have seen that it's seven layers, or they may have read that it's five layers, but it doesn't matter. The idea is that you have seven layers that are theoretically independent of each other, insulated, but we will see that it's not like that. And uh, in the, these seven layers uh, have a different scope, okay? We will now understand what is a layer. So the layer is like the unit of modularity. The idea is that uh, this layer in paradigm give the different uh, scopes of the, of the network uh, cer certain modularity and uh, inside of this layer there are different protocols that their function is to perform the task of the layer, okay? So, uh, here we have, in the very first one, uh, well, this I will go after. Well, let me, let me mention it now. Uh, as I said, it's loosely, uh, loosely similar to the OSI uh, model, but there are different startup developing associations for each protocol uh, inside each layer. So this makes it, uh, it's a little tricky. So for example, you have the Institute of Electronic and Electric Engineering, and you have the IATF, we have the 3GPP. Uh, these are standard developing associations who create the protocols, who de uh, develop and publish the protocols. Why do we need protocols? Because without protocols, uh, two different machines cannot, uh, cannot communicate to each other. There are very strict laws that need to be followed in order to all the diversity of machines being able to communicate to each other. Okay, so uh, I will just, uh, for you not to forget, like the, we will go through the most uh, important layers to understand a little bit how now telecommunications uh, and network architecture works. Okay, so let me write it like here. First we have physical, then we have data link. What's happening here? Oh. Then we have network. 
then we have transport and then we have application so as I just mentioned inside these layers there will be protocols uh, the list of protocols that are needed for a certain network is called protocol stack and we will come back to this concept later okay so the very first one is the physical layer can does someone know what the physical layer does okay so basically it's the uh, transmission and reception of unstructured unstructured raw data this unstructured raw data is uh, basically the bits the famous bits these bits can be electrical, uh, radio frequency, or optical. So the physical layer uh, resolves the problem, for example, the modulation, the voltage level, the maximum distance that we can transmit in a link, okay? So it's very, it's very simple. So layer number two is a data link layer. So data link layer is the layer that's, that's uh, mission is to connect point to point adjacent, uh, uh, adjacent uh, devices, okay? So for example, it uh, detects and maybe corrects errors in the, of, of the lower layer of the physical layer. It uh, establishes and terminates connection between two physical devices. It uh, controls the flow, okay? And uh, one protocol that I want to mention here Actually, I want to mention two. You probably have heard of them. One is Wi-Fi, and one, the other one is Ethernet. Okay, so you have heard about those, right? Okay, good. So, uh, a little fast about layer three. Um, the aim of the layer three, that is the network uh, layer, is to be able to find the path in between the origin and the destiny, the client and the server. In order to have this, you will have uh, addresses. We need to locate the, the devices, right? So this address is the famous IP address. You might have heard about this, right? IP, you have heard about this, right? Okay, good. So the are two versions of IP. If there is IPv4 and IPv6, okay. Um, but that's uh, that's not, that's not important. The idea is that uh, the, the the most known is the IPv4. IPv6 is kind of new, even though it's been uh, worked for more than ten years on it. It's a 32-bit uh, address that uh, help us to connect to our to find the path in order to our message, our packet, to reach from client to server, okay? Layer four is transport layer. Transport layer, uh, it, its aim is to connect from uh, origin to uh, destiny, right? So it controls the reliability of the link from end to beginning, right? Uh, so here you have other functions like retransmission, and uh, the two main uh, protocols here are UDP and TCP, okay? So, and uh, I will talk a little bit about this because it's important for later. Uh, does anyone know about TCP or UDP? Okay, so basically the acknowledgement is when I send a packet, and uh, the destination receives it, it says, okay, I received it. That's the acknowledgement, yeah. okay? So TCP, for example, has acknowledgement, but UDP doesn't have acknowledgement. And for handshake is when a communication is going to be established, handshake is like that, it's like saying hello. Like the two devices know, okay, we are starting a communication. For TCP, you don't need, and for TCP, you do have a handshake, and for UDP, you do not, you do not have a handshake. TCP is mostly used, as you say, for reliable communications, and UDP more for flows. Like when you call, you don't care if uh, there is a packet loss, you just want it to be as fast as possible, okay? So for this, we use ports. Does anyone know what a port? So the port is the communication endpoint. So there are specific ports, there are well-known ports that identify the service that is being provided. For example, HTTP 80, right? So, and there are other ports that are open, right? So the server should be always listening to this port. This is important because it gives a lot of security problems, okay? So we 
talked about TCP, IP, architecture, and we talk about these protocols. Uh, when we say TCP, IP, architecture, we don't necessarily mean TCP, IP uh, protocols, right? Protocol stack. We can have other protocols. For example, we can use UDP, we can use other uh, layer two protocols, right? So, uh, another thing that is important to know before we start with RENA is how do we measure the performance of a network? When do we say that a network is performant and when do we say that uh, it's not working as well? And we have two key concepts here, that is quality of experience, QOE, and quality of service, QoS. Can, does someone know? So quality of experience basically is you are watching a video and the video, like you can watch it in high quality, super fast, everything works good. And you call someone on Skype or on WhatsApp and the call goes well. In that case, you are having a good quality of experience, right? And quality of service are the parameters that are set up in the network in order to enhance the quality of experience, right? So quality of service is more of a technical concept. Quality of experience is what you think of the service you are being uh, uh, given. Okay, so for quality of service, there are four uh, key elements that I want to mention. First is, that is delay, that is very clear, is how, uh, how much time does it take from the origin to the destiny for the packet to reach. And then we have jitter, and this is a little bit more complex, so I want just uh, for you to see. So let's imagine here we have, sorry, here we have time, and uh, here we have number of packets. Okay, so he, most of them reach here, then at this time, then at this time, then at this time, and here, and then you will end up something here, here. So what is the delay of the communication? With just one number, you cannot say, right? Because this has this delay, this has this delay, this has this delay, you just cannot say. So we need two, two things. We need the delay, that is like uh, the mean, right? And we need the jitter, which is the variance of the mean, okay? And then we have packet loss. That is an easy concept. Packet loss is uh, if you lose packets, how, what's the percentage of packets that are lost in the link? And then we have uh, bandwidth. That is the most widely known one because when you hire an internet service for your house, what you are asking is for like big bandwidth, okay? But there is some difference here. Uh, when you don't have uh, bandwidth with qu no quality of service, right, uh, the, all the traffic is best effort, so you need to share. If you need, you are like um, talking to your grandma on Skype and your brother is uh, watching high quality video, uh, probably the call is not going to be very good. Uh, in case you had quality of experience, you can say, okay, this is more important, so this, uh, I want to reserve this bandwidth to my communication. And the, the, rest of the, the rest of the flows are best effort, so they will need to compete for the, for the bandwidth, okay? So that, those are the uh, key concepts on quality of service. We will come back on that. So now, very briefly, we will talk about the, the problems with TCP IP, okay? The first one is, I want to ask you if you think that, like, okay, if you think that Internet is an internet, or it's just like one big uh, network. Uh, all the networking part in TCP IP is IP, actually. So what you have is a huge IP network, and uh, what, is, what is, why we say that there are networks when they actually are not is because the administrator of those systems, of those networks are different. But in the end, technically, they are the same network, so actually, if you need non-IP forwarding, you just cannot do it like that. You need some ad hoc solution in your network, okay? Then there is uh, problems with layers. From what you see, like what, which kind of problem can you see from the functions that we were talking about in the first, uh, in the first part? Do you think that layers are actually insulated? Yes? So no, they are not insulated, actually. There are problems, for example, there are common, uh, they are, uh, common things that they do. For example, data link and transport all, both can do retransmission and flow control. So you don't have like one function per layer very clearly defined, 
Okay. Another problem that you have is that the functionality of the layers is not independent. And what I mean with this, uh, you just cannot say, okay, I take out this layer and I put uh, another protocol here and this is going to work. This doesn't happen. Uh, even though theoretically what we learn in books is that uh, there should be a clear uh, difference in between the functionalities and a clear interface in between the layers, that's not true. That's, it's, that's not how it happens in, in reality in the industry. Then we have a fixed number of layers uh, which uh, limit us in the number of scopes that we can have in our network, okay? And this has caused the proliferation of other prot protocols. For example, MPLS. I don't know if anyone has worked with networks and knows what MPLS is, but basically it's a protocol that is here. Uh, it's like here. So they say it's a 2.5 layer network. So we have like this kind of weird things and layers in the middle of layers. And uh, then we have, because of this, we have dozens of protocols uh, in each layer because uh, it's here we just named the, the most uh, important ones, but uh, you have protocols for security, protocols for control, protocols for uh, creating virtual networks, for virtualization of networks. So this uh, one communication, one real communication takes actually dozens of protocols from the, start, from the client to the server. This makes the debugging of problems really, really hard, extremely, extremely complex, and it creates also a problem that is called overhead. <laughs> okay, the overhead is basically, as you have so many protocols, one, in between the, one inside the other, uh, you have a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of the data that is being transported is just information about the protocols, and very few of it is just the data itself that you want to do you want to send? So you have like a huge bandwidth and most of it you are using it just to send information, to send uh, information about the, uh, the link itself. Um, so also as we mentioned before, uh, the, standard, the standardizing organizations are different. So uh, this makes a little bit the, the, the governing of internet kind of complex because there are a lot of political organizations uh, fighting each other in order to have uh, uh, their, the, the last uh, uh, protocol published, okay? There is no support for multi-homing. Uh, multi-homing is, let me just do a little bit here. For example, you have your house, right? So. You have here the internet, and you use, I don't know which, I don't want to, I don't know if I could, but for example, you use Yukon. And the other, here you have the ISP, the internet service provider, you have, which is another one in Armenia. Uh, Viva said, okay. Okay, and you have your computer here. Can you, con can you do this at this moment? No, you cannot do it just like uh, naturally. You need some ad hoc uh, solution. And this is important because, for example, if you have like uh, a very important link that you want to keep and UCOM is off and you want to work with VivaCell when UCOM is off, like it's very hard to do it at this moment, right? Uh, there is another problem that is mobility and this is something that you may have experienced. You realize that when you are talking on the phone and you are in the car, it's completely different, the quality of experience, than when you are like uh, just sitting in your house, right? It's completely different. Um, so mobility is that, it's changing the point of attachment. Right now, to make mobility possible, there are something that is called uh, tunnels. There are IP tunnels, so you just can go and change uh, the antenna as you move but it adds a lot of problems. It adds uh, a lot of processing power. That's why your battery is going like super low when you are like in the phone in the, in the car. And uh, there is also a problem with latency, okay? So it makes the quality of experience much worse. Um, so we talk about complexity. Also, another, uh, another problem with uh, the 
with the structure itself of TCP IP is that there is no clear interface in between the layers. For example, in the, app, in the application, uh, when you need to develop an application and you need a network, you have some network requirement, uh, you have the socket uh, API, right? But you need to know uh, the IP address and if you are using TCP or IP and the, and the port, right? So there is no actually uh, there there is no uh, a there is no an interface. You actually need to like there is supposed to be an interface, but there is no an interface because you actually need to know the information of the lower layers, right? So if uh, you change suddenly, like for some reason, the port is changed, your application is if it's hard coded, your application is not going to work anymore. So you have some problems there. Uh, another problem of TCP/IP it's it's naming. Uh, I don't know if you have ever configured a switch or a router, but uh, let me do it like this. If you have a route, for example, one switch, one IP switch, okay? You have, for example, uh, 24, 24 ports. IP switch. Okay, so for each port, you will have one IP address. So what does it mean? That if I am connected in the 24 ports to my computer, imagine that. In the routing table for my computer to find this, we need 24 IP address. This makes the routing tables really long, okay? And this adds, as the routing table is so long because you are actually naming the points of attachment and you are not naming the node itself. Uh, the search in the routing table takes more time and it adds delay and it makes the quality of experience worse. Okay? Uh, then about uh, the naming and addressing is that we don't have application names. We have the URL that is what you like google.com or Rinalminia.com, <laughs> and uh, but this is not actually an application name. It's an it's a translation between an IP and uh, an URL. Okay, so if uh, our server change the IP, let's imagine that you have a you have a, a web page, you have a server, and for some reason you change the IP, and you write Rinalminia.com, and it has changed the IP. You just cannot access. There is it's just a translation. Okay. And uh, finally, uh, the security. Security is a huge topic. We could talk hours about it. But uh, the very, very uh, big concept that I want you to remember is that TCP IP was not created to be a secure network. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. a best effort and secure architecture. Uh, this brings problems because for every protocol that you create in the TCP IP network, you need another protocol that, uh, to, that secures this protocol. Okay. So for example, for IP, you have IPsec. Okay. And for DNS, you have DNSSEC. And this, uh, this creates a lot of holes in the architecture that uh, are open for, an at for attacks, for different attacks. Um, the, also, like the, the use of we said in transport uh, in transport layer, the use of well-known ports and listening ports uh, make it uh, easier to attack because you are you are always listening. Your IP is always there, and as your IP is public, I can know with just a simple trace route how to reach you or with a ping. Okay, so. TCP/IP is not a secure network. It was not thought to be a secure network. All the secure features are add-ons that work partially. And we have a lot of problems right now with this. So to finish this very first, I know that it's a lot of concepts for the ones who didn't do networking before, but what I want you to understand is that at this point, the key concept is that at this point, um, the TCP/IP architecture and the internet, how we know it today, is a bottleneck for future developments, okay? We just cannot, uh, all these uh, things that are in the media about how great 5G is going to be, all the devices are going to be connected into internet, this is just not, this just cannot happen as it full potential without the infrastructure behind. And the infrastructure is flawed and it eventually needs to be fixed somehow, 
At this point, what we, it has been done is adding ad hoc solutions and making the protocol stack, stack hard, uh, more and more and more and more complex. So um, we will go in the second uh, in the second part of the talk after a coffee break. So thank you. First, thank you for your attention on the very first part. So I wanted to ask you if you have actually any question about uh, the topics that we've covered so far. I know that it's like very technical and maybe there are too many concepts, but uh, maybe you have some questions, some comments, some uh, angry comments, sad comments, I don't know. You don't want me to point one of you until like you have to speak now, right? So, <laughs> okay. So if you don't have any question, I will make you a question, and one of you will have to answer. Actually, more than one. Uh, from what we've seen so far, uh, who should connect uh, to each other, the devices or the applications? Okay, so the ones who think that uh, uh, devices should connect to each other, please. Tana. <laughs> and the ones who think that applications are the ones who should connect to each other. Okay, so the second ones were the right. Applications are the one that even though it's not happening today, at this point uh, are the devices which connect to each other. The applications should be uh, the ones who connect to each other. Uh, this is a major change of focus of what networking is today, okay? So, in case you don't have any more questions, uh, I want us to understand a little bit what is a network, uh, but more on a almost epistemological level, okay? So there is no need to be technical at this point. Uh, well, maybe a little bit. So, <laughs> uh, in the very first image, you have one host. Uh, one uh, one device. When I say host or device or server or client or whatever, it could be it could be a computer, a phone. I don't care. A tablet, uh, whatever uh, hardware that makes some computation. Okay, uh, and we have two processes. Okay, in one computer we have many processes, and these processes want to communicate to each other. What do they do? Well, the operating the operating systems provide an uh, Interprocess communication. Okay, so the two processes can communicate to each other. So this is uh, what happens now. This is nothing groundbreaking, but uh, let's let's think a little bit. In case these two processes are not in the same uh, hardware, what would change? change? That says missing change. It's the two processes are not in the same hardware. They are in two different hardwares, and these two are connected through a wire. Does the interprocess communication change, or is the same? What do you think? <laughs> hmm? Right. It will be the same, exactly the same uh, interprocess communication, but with more delay, right? And in case we, we don't have like two hosts on a wire, but we have a network, okay? One part is wire, another part is Wi-Fi wireless, okay? It's still the same. It's an interprocess communication, in a distributed application, okay? So actually networking is distributing distributed systems. So this is, as I said, this is not groundbreaking, but it has important consequence that I want uh, to discuss with you, okay? So this is exactly what you said, uh, that computer networking is inter-process communication, and a network is actually a distributed imperfect machine that copies the data from uh, one device to the other, uh, adding some delay, okay? And uh, in this sense, okay, the internet would be uh, an agreement between different uh, service providers, different companies, uh, that uh, they, so they exchange communicator, communicate, uh, traffic, sorry, for mutual benefit, okay? And uh, there would be m many internets. Uh, and the, mass, the biggest one and the most common one would be the internet with capital Y. But there could be m many internets. Uh, one internet would be different networks connected to each other. Okay? 
So what is uh, the job of this inter-process communication? What do they do? You have two processes in different hosts and they communicate to each other. What, and this is an inter-process communication process. What's the job of it? This, it's very simple. Maybe relay the data, send the data from one point to the other. It's as simple as that. Okay? So what is RINA? Okay, so RINA means a recursive internet work architecture. Architecture, we already know what's an architecture. What is an architecture? So the architecture is actually the com mechanisms that are common and the policies that are common in order to create one network. So this internet, uh, this RINA is an architecture, okay, that would replace TCP IP. And it's a uh, recursive, and I know that there are some programmers here, so probably know what recursivity is, can someone know? So it's an object that is defined in its own terms. So it's calling itself. So we will see why RINA is uh, recursive in a few minutes, okay? An internet work, we already said, because it's about connecting different networks and creating an internet, okay? So, uh, one important concept that I will repeat several times is uh, this one. Maximize the variable and minimize the variable. What does this mean? It means uh, having as much commonality as possible in the design of our network. We don't want uh, a lot of different concepts like with TCP IP that is like so mixing, there are so many protocols uh, going around. We want to catch the invariant part of all the protocols and all the network functions and maximize it and what we want to minimize the invariant part, okay? Um, so, uh, now let's talk a little bit about how RINA works, and this could be a little bit much technical, I will try to make it as easy as possible, but for you to understand, so, uh, as we said, we have uh, two processes that want to talk to each other, and they are distributed in the sense that they are in different hosts, okay? Uh, so, uh, this is called um, distributed application processes. They are processes that are distributed. And these two distributed application processes that want to talk to each other constitute a distributed application facility, as you, say, as you see here. So in order to exchange information, these two processes this, that are distributed need some underlying facility that provides them uh, communicational services. Uh, this underlying facility is the distributed IPC facility, which means distributed inter-process communication facility, or DIF. This DIF is a layer, and it will be the only layer that we have in RINA. In TCPIP, we have five or seven layers, depending on the author. In RINA, we will just have one, okay? That's the DIF, okay? So, these DIFs, uh, these DAPs, these processes, ask for an underlying process that is called IPC process, inter-process communication process, to provide them uh, the networking, the communicational services. And these IPCPs are communicating to each other through a layer that is called the DIF, right? So, uh, this DIF and these IPCPs inside the DIFs are also distributed uh, applications. So they can call another DIF in behind. And this is where the recursion comes from. Uh, the s same layer is calling itself as many times as you want, as the designer of the network want, but until reaching the physical media, okay? The physical layer, let's say. Uh, so the scope of the network is as the, as the designer of the network decides. There is no one fixed scope. And uh, I want you to see a little bit this. And you have like three different colors. Uh, can someone think, for example, uh, the orange color, it's uh, the diff of the orange color, uh, which uh, scope is about? We, we, who, who is talking to each other? Who is receiving the services 
of the orange color layer. The host. The what? The host. The host this, not the host. Remember the applications. Okay. So the applications are taking the hello, the <laughs> the services of this orange div. But then we have, for example, imagine that this host is you in your house, okay? And you have one border router, the UCOM router that you use in your, I don't want to use UCOM so many times, so it thinks that they are paying us, they are not. But uh, the, the internet service provider that is um, giving us a, a, an internet connection, okay? So this is you, this is your private network. And imagine this is your, the, this is the, uh, private network of the internet service provider. Okay, so the sky blue div would be in the scope of what? Of the network of the internet service provider, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the low, this lowest one, what uh, does? Uh, they are like point to point, right? You see that they are like from one device to other device. It's an, uh, it's a div from one device to other device. So the scope of it is just like the link layer scope is uh, host to host to scope, right? And underlying that, you just have the physical media. So we just uh, define a network with one, only one layer. So I don't know if you think this is groundbreaking or not, but clearly it's much more easy than seven layers with different functionalities each layer and with different structure and protocols each layer, right? Which one do you think it's easier to understand? This one, right? seems pretty much more simple. So, uh, this is a little bit what we were talking about, like you have the applications that uh, request a, ser a service from the IPCB processes, and those request a service from an underlying one, which is connected to the physical media, right? And uh, also, why we have different layers uh, in the different uh, scopes? Because each scope can have different policies. For example, security. Uh, let's go back to this, uh, this example. This is your private network. Do you need encryptation in your public private network? Probably, probably not, right? Uh, because uh, the, your data is just contained uh, in your network. But if your data is going to the public internet, you may need some, secu some extra security mechanisms. So the security mechanism of the sky blue div are going to to be completely different of this diff, right? Because one is your private network, another is your is a, a public network. And in the public network, everyone can yes. hack it. Let's go back to the concept of maximizing the invariable parts and minimizing the variable parts, OK? So what do we have now? How many protocols we have now? Dozens. Yeah. Many of them hard to manage. Uh, we need experts with a lot of knowledge and a lot of years in the field to understand how the network actually works. If there is a problem in the network, it's actually really hard to find where the problem is. You have all the seven layers, every layer, ten protocols. It's very complex. So, but let's think about it together. For example, routing protocols, the ones who have seen about the routing protocols. Uh, one part of a routing protocol could be um, Up updating a uh, database, right? So why do we have, I don't know, ISIS, BGP, OSPF, and so many other protocols that do exactly the same task? This is an invariant part. And then the other routing part, how, how other things are decided, that is the, in the, that is the variable part. So why, let's think together, why don't we uh, create some protocols that take all the invariabilities and make them mechanisms of the protocol and with the variabilities, the different parts, they make them policies. And let's do I know, the thing that you were saying about TCP and UDP. So TCP has handshake. Remember handshake is what? Like we are going to talk. And UDP is just like you drop the data. Why the handshake is not just a mechanism and calling handshake or not calling it a, a policy? This thing, instead of having two protocols, you just have one, and you just call the parts that you want, the variable parts, right? This makes it uh, much, much easier. And just uh, to make it a little bit more interactive, so I think it's to see if you understood something. Uh, what do we want from the protocols, these new protocols that we are going to apply 
in the layer, this div layer that recourses itself. What do we want? For example, I will just say something that I want, uh, a clear API. So a clear uh, mm, set of functions and a clear uh, different uh, interface that uh, with these functions I don't need, I can replace totally the, the layer and not uh, know exactly what they do, but just like using the requirements, just like saying the requirements and getting uh, the services that I want. So w what else that we saw? Something easy. Okay, another more simple. I want uh, in this pr these protocols to have, um, let's say, um, security and privacy, yeah. right? That it's a problem that TCP/IP has. Which other thing do you think that these protocols should? Okay. QoS, for example. To remember that TCP/IP doesn't have quality of service. You can just in the public internet, and you are going to say yes, but in the public internet you just cannot have it. But so maybe we want a clear uh, quality of service uh, uh, definition, right? And uh, being able to really deploy it on the internet. Uh, what else? Support program programmability. Right now we just cannot program the network. Support, do you remember the thing that I wrote that are connected to two different uh, uh, internet service provider that was multi-homing, support multi-homing, support mobility, inherently, without uh, ad hoc solutions, without more protocols to make the stack more complex. So we want a set of protocols that do all these things, maximize the invariable parts and uh, minimize the variable parts. Okay? The result of this uh, research is that we actually only need two protocols for the whole communication. Do you remember the stack, this one? I will just put it to, for you to see clearly the difference. Mm -hmm. Where was it? Uh, here. All these protocols for one communication. Do you see the difference? And now we only need two. Just by applying this maxima. Maximize the invariable and minimize the variable part. We only need two protocols. We need mechanisms. And uh, these common mechanisms, we call them or we don't call them. And if we call them, with which parameter? And those are the policies. So let me come back. Uh, what do these two protocols do? Well, one will be for data transfer, that is the error and flow con uh, control protocol, the EFCP. And the other one is for layer management, that is the CDAP, that is a common distributed application protocol, okay? Uh, I will really fast, this is like very, very technical, but very fast what they do. Like, uh, actually you can see it here. The error and flow control protocol, uh, what they do is they, it's the single transfer uh, protocol of the layer. And uh, what uh, you have it actually here. For example, it will take care of the retransmission of the flow control and all the mechanism involved in the data transfer. Okay? And for the layer management, we have the CDAP. And the CDAP, what we'll do is modify a uh, uh, what is called the read the resource information base. The resource information base is a distributed uh, database that contains all the shared state, all the shared information in the layer. Okay, for example, uh, the QoS parameters that are going to be put in place, the security parameters that are going to be put in place, the addressing, the private addressing. Okay, so this is very technical, and we will go deeper on that on the long course. Okay. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about some the RINA benefits of applying this, uh, uh, after applying this maxima. Uh, first, the addressing. As do you remember that I mentioned that IP is not a complete addressing schema, that we only name point of attachments. Well, with RINA, we actually have a complete uh, addressing structure, right? For example, we have application names, we have node names, and we also have point of attachment names. The application names will be, uh, will be uh, public. So 
Yes. <laughs> so, for example, when the application moves from one server to another and it changes the point of attachment uh, address, with Rina you will be able just by uh, up updating your by the uh, sequential updating of your uh, routing information, you will be able to reach it. Right now with TCPIP, you just cannot do that. Uh, the nodes, also you have uh, node names, right? Uh, the node names will be the names of the hosts, right? And uh, these nodes uh, can be connected to more than one point of attachment. The path will be, so the routing is much more simple. It's just like two step processes. The first, uh, you from one point to the other, uh, a route, a route as a sequence of node is calculated and for each hope, the point of attachment uh, s uh, will be selected from the specific, with the specific uh, policies, okay? Uh, one important, uh, actually two important consequences of having this naming uh, system is that multi-homing and mobility are achieved just as a consequence of the uh, structure itself, okay? So you don't need any ad hoc solution, nothing in the protocols. You just have multi-homing and mobility just because uh, these other things works the way it works because you have public uh, um, application names and uh, the private uh, node names and this, these applications are, uh, are registered to the lower uh, to the lower uh, lower layers, right? So another another important uh, uh, consequence of this is the security. As I just mentioned, that uh, the uh, host names are private. This kind of uh, denial of service attacks when one just like uh, turns down one node and uh, connects to your network, it's just like not possible. If case that you have all the authentication and access control policies put in place. And as you have the authentication and access policies put in place when the two interprocess communications uh, engage to the other, you don't need, for example, firewalls, right? Because all the, all the let's say, firewalling mechanisms are included just in the way the, this architecture is made. Uh, so, um, if uh, the, the, the correct uh, policies are put in place, we can say that uh, this diff is actually a secure container. It's not possible that uh, a external attacker just hacks you. Okay. Uh, yeah. The thing is that you will have the firewalling part and the filtering part. You will have it. With when the two uh, process engage to the other and create the layer, the diff layer. The, aut the authentication is there. So the idea is can you limit with some region? Yeah. That's, it. That's why you also have the recursive part. Because the regions will be defined when ah. you uh, create the diff and select the scope of each layer. But then you No, you have. Uh, it's private, so the hosts are private, and it's a. Uh, it's uh, 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 They are decided when you create the, the 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 layer itself. It's internal to the layer. Okay. Uh, another benefit is that you have. I know it's like. It's very different to the approach that it's uh, being held today. That's why it's like, what is this? But uh, it's interesting. It's interesting how just with very simple, just with understanding what a network is and taking all the computer science uh, behind uh, uh, inter-process communication theories in operating systems and making it distributed, you just don't need a lot of the solutions that are being uh, around in the market because the architecture right now doesn't support it. It's actually very interesting. So another thing is that you have a clear quality of service uh, model uh, 
where you can define if your service is cherished in the sense that you care or you don't care about packet loss, or if it's urgent in the sense that you want uh, more or less latency is needed. Okay. Um, Another thing that I want to mention is uh, the network management that we already talked a little bit about this, but just having two protocols, like this clear difference, just like having two protocols in the same layer that recourses itself uh, really lowers the operational cost of networks. Uh, it's much easier to debug uh, when you don't have a link, you, don't ha you cannot access a, a a service, it's much more easy to check uh, where is the problem because you only have one type of layer and uh, you have just two protocols in between that layer. And it's uh, much easier to train the people in order to be able to solve those problems. Okay? So now about uh, your question, I think, about deployment. So this is a this is a question that may come like very often in the sense like, okay, this infrastructure is like so widely deployed, millions of millions of millions have been spent on deploying it and how are we going to change it? Like it's kind of crazy. So uh, there are different deployment, uh, uh, deployment techniques for networks. Uh, the idea is uh, the RENA community at this moment is not aiming to a big bang kind of deployment. Mm -hmm. In the sense that we are not just like turning down everything and just putting RENA on it. There are some techniques that are interesting to see. Do you remember the seven, uh, wait, the seven layers? Two, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's do it five. Okay, so the five layers. Uh, we can actually use RINA as an overlay of these layers. And it's, we can have, for example, physical, and then we can have uh, data link, in the sense, for example, Ethernet or Wi Fi. And here we can have RINA as one, layer. As one, as one type of layer, one layer. but uh, as many layers as you want. And in this scope, you have all the RINA benefits. And you don't need to change your uh, your devices. Another option is using Rina as an under layer. So, for example, in this case, uh, so you have IP, TCP, and everything you have here. Here you have Rina, and here you have Ethernet, IP, for example, Ethernet, and physical, and Rina here. And here you can have something like an MPLS kind of or virtual private network in between. And you also don't need to change all your devices. In case you want to have just one RENA uh, network working inside your private network, for example, you have an IoT uh, yeah. company, right? Uh, and uh, RENA is very beneficial for IoT because it has much less overhead, uh, you have quality of service, okay? So what you could have is so this is a um, TCP IP network. Here you have a gateway, and here your RINA network. So what's the conclusion? What I want you to understand with this uh, approach is that actually RINA can be deployed incrementally when the right initiatives are found. There is no need to tear, that, tear down everything and deploy RINA uh, on it, and it's this is very important because of the uh, investments costs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, as a summary, like the key concepts that I want to, you to remember, uh, first is that there is a way to understand the computer networking, like scientific mm -hmm. networking. Uh, this is not just uh, a solution that uh, is inherited and is like widely deployed, like TCP/IP but it has like flows on it. The RINA is understanding all those flows, but uh, we are not creating a new architecture to solve those flows. We are creating a new architecture because we understand what computer networking is, and from that, all those problems that we had, we see that they are uh, solved, okay? Another important concept is maximizing the invariable part and making everything much simpler, okay? And Another important thing that I want you to understand is that there's just like one layer that recourses itself depending on the scope. 
And this makes the operational much more easy because it's much more simple, just two protocols and one layer. And the deployment uh, should be only where the right initiatives uh, are found and there is no need to big band, there is no need for a big band deployment and tearing down all the investments that have been done so far. But what is important is that RINA uh, allows all the, um, all these new technologies like uh, IoT, like 5G, like blockchain, uh, it gives the necessary infrastructure for them to grow, okay? So, and find their, their potential, their tr truly potential. So, for more information, I want you to invite you in January that we will have a long course on the, every topic that we cover. I know that there were like a lot of concepts, but every topic that we cover more, specific, more in detail and more on a practical oriented approach. And uh, there is some bibliography in the case you want to read more also. Uh, you can contact me. I have also my cards and you can contact anyone in the team. So, that's it. Thank you very much.